And now I'm going to hit the start webinar. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is Roxanne Truen with the Michigan State University Science Festival for the last talk of the night. I'm here with Dr. Stacy Camp, who's going to talk about archaeology and I think specifically archaeology related to children, which I'm really excited to hear about. And um, if you have questions, if you're listening on the Zoom webinar, you can type them into Q&A. And if you're listening on Facebook Live, you can type them into the comments section and we'll answer those at the end of the session. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Camp. Great, thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see, and I'll put it in present mode. Does that look okay, Roxanne? Looks perfect. Great, thank you all for having me here tonight and for showing up at, this is a late time here in Michigan, so thank you for coming in. Hopefully I don't go in and out, my internet's been a little iffy today. So um, I'm presenting on behalf of a number of us. I'm the director of the Campus Archaeology Program here at Michigan State University. And the Campus Archaeology Program we call CAP. It was established in 2005 by Professor Emeritus Dr. Lynn Goldstein, who reti retired in 2018. The MSU Campus Archaeology Program is funded via a permanent line item in the university's general budget and through the MSU Graduate School. Our mission is prote to protect and mitigate archaeological resources on MSU's campus and to publicly disseminate our findings. We train undergraduate and graduate students in the practice of historical and archaeological research while studying MSU's varied and rich history. So as I said, I took over the campus archaeology program in 2018. I'm the director now. And one of our authors is Autumn Painter, and she was a campus archaeologist from 2018 to 2020. Uh, she's a PhD student, almost done. And then Jeff Burnett, who's another PhD student, took over as a campus archaeologist from Autumn in the summer of 2020 last year. I want to thank the organizers of Science Festival, MSU Science Festival, for having us here tonight for our talk on our latest research. And I know this has been a huge undertaking to put all of Science Fest online. So I appreciate all the efforts on behalf of the Science Fest mm -hmm. staff and personnel for doing this. All right, so I'm gonna to get to my talk. When one thinks of a college campus, a number of images come to mind. Parties, dining halls, dormitories, drinking, late nights, libraries, lecture halls, sports, roommates, books, protests. What typically doesn't come to mind is an image of children exploring laboratories and living in dormitories with their parents and college students. And what follows, we explore the hidden history of children on Michigan State University's campus using archeological and archival evidence. These data sets, which have been analyzed by the MSU Campus Archeology span Program, responsible for overseeing campus's archeological heritage, reveal the changing role children played on campus from the university's meager beginnings as a swampy backwater agricultural school to its dramatic transformation into one of the largest and most well-known land-grant universities in the U.S. Children um, or childhood is generally considered to be a, a period of time in which people are taught cultural norms and guidelines. We focus on how this enculturation process varied across time and space on campus due to both the campus's changing demographics and shifting ideas about the role children should play on university campuses. To investigate these attitudes towards children at MSU, we focus on three areas of campus that either have significant archeological or archival evidence of children's presence. The first area of campus is known as Saints Rest, which was the first dormitory on campus and dates from 1857 to 1876. The second site is Faculty Row, which dates from 1857 to the 1910s and was the first housing constructed for faculty. Lastly, we will look at the expansion of campus due to the GI Bill, which involved housing numerous families on campus from 1945 to 1959. We examined places where children would have lived on campus during the years in which the university was in operation. We do not explore the lives of indigenous children who lived on MSU land, 
which occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Ashinaabe, the Three Fi Fires Confederacy of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi uh, peoples. While perceptions of college housing are often focused on students' accommodations, some early staff at MSU, then Michigan Agricultural College or MAC, lived on campus with their families. From 1857 to the late 1910s, several college faculty and staff residences dotted the campus landscape, including Faculty Row, Saints Rest, and Williams Hall dormitories, a herdsman's house, and a farm manager's house. Our investigation of staff families focuses on the first dormitory on campus, Saints Rest. Saints Rest was an all-male dormitory built in 1857 and destroyed by a fire in 1876. Although the dormitory was constructed to feed and house male college students, historical records and secondary sources show that until 1870, college staff and their families resided in the building alongside students. The recovery of child-related artifacts during excavations of a pre-1870 privy or outhouse associated with the dormitory provides additional evidence that college students and families shared the space. While Saints Rest was undoubtedly a male dominated space, it was also a place where families lived and children likely grew up. Saints Rest was divided into student rooms, a kitchen, parlor, laundry room, dining room, as well as apartments for the stewards family and for kitchen staff. Unlike the students, staff remained in the dormitory full time, further complicating a solely student focused perception of the building. One of the early stewards of Saints Rest, Fitz A. Stebbins, who began his tenure in April 1863, resided with his family in the dormitory and records show that they were afforded entire control over the boarding hall, with the exception of rooms assigned to the farm manager and interim steward and his family who also resided in Saints Rest. Many other stewards, staff, and their families likely took up residence at Saints Rest until 1870, when the staff quarters, the kitchens, and the dining hall were moved to the newly constructed Williams Hall dormitory. Professional stewards were to remain part of college life until 1883, when they were replaced by student workers. The presence of these employees and their families as the only full-time residents of Saints Rest and the only residents likely to have children asks us to reconceptualize the populations of dormitories on campus prior to 1883. Saints Rest was first excavated in 2005 during a field school held by the MSU Department of Anthropology. Despite successfully locating the building's foundation, recovered material culture was mainly limited to institutional ceramics and structural debris and hardware. Unfortunately for archeologists, by 1876, the boarding and social functions of the building had shifted to Williams Hall. Additionally, the fire in 1876 occurred during the winter break, meaning few personal effects would have been in the building at the time. As a result, the excavation provided few insights into the daily lives of the individuals who resided in the dormitory. However, this would change in 2015 when a six foot by six foot, foot brick line privy or at house was discovered near the location of Saints Rest by MSU campus archeologists during routine construction monitoring. Because they served a secondary function as convenient places to dispose of trash, privies often contain high densities of material culture, typically deposited in discrete temporal layers. As these facilities were regularly cleaned out and typically closed and buried at the end of their useful life, the well-preserved cultural material within often represents a narrow time period. As such, privies often provide important insights into the health patterns of consumption and the personal, cultural, and social lives of people residing in a particular area. The date range of the Privy's artifacts, the 1850s to 1860s, as well as its location, approximately 10 meters or 30 feet southwest of Saints Rest, strongly suggests it may have been associated with the building. Since the Privy artifacts, what archaeologists call an assemblage, 
predate 1870, it is likely that artifacts were deposited and the context closed prior to the construction of Williams Hall and thus prior to the removal of dining and social spaces, including staff apartments. Artifacts recovered from the privy include ironstone ceramic vessels, glass lampshades and drinking cups, botanical remains like seeds, animal bones and building hardware. Most notable, however, was a large quantity of personal items, including smoking pipes, buttons, shoes, buckles, a straight razor, vulcanized rubber combs, and two ceramic dolls. The two dolls, a 10 centimeter tall intact frozen Charlotte figurine, and a shattered but fully reconstructable porcelain doll head were unexpected finds at the all-male dormitory. Small, undecorated, and unclothed frozen Charlotte figurines were a common toy during the second half of the 19th century and were linked to a cautionary Victorian poem. In the poem, a young girl named Charlotte ignores her mother's warning to cover up on a cold winter's night and freezes solid, passing away. These inexpensive figurines were widely accessible to American consumers who often baked them into cakes as a small surprise for children. The doll head, on the other hand, is highly decorated with a finely painted face indicating the doll may have been a more cherished possession compared to the figurine. Despite the lack of a maker's mark, the doll was dated to the early 1860s to 1870s based on the flat top hairstyle, which became popular during the American Civil War. By the late 1860s, following the post-Civil War boom and the mass production of porcelain dolls, dolls of this kind, while not cheap, were becoming more accessible for the growing American middle classes. The three holes in the shoulder plate show that the head would have been articulated to a cloth body with attached porcelain hands and feet. Unlike early por earlier porcelain dolls, which tended to be entirely ceramic, like the frozen Charlotte we saw earlier, a porcelain doll with a cloth body would have been more appealing to children, who often preferred rag dolls over show pieces. Both artifacts indicate the presence of children in and around Saint's Rest. The multiple connections between the frozen Charlotte figurine and young girls during the mid 19th century, the fact it was unbroken, and the disposable nature of the toy all indicate that it likely belonged to a child living near or in Saint's Rest. A porcelain doll, on the other hand, could have belonged to an adult just as easily as a child. However, the doll head recovered from the privy had a cloth body, suggesting it was purchased as a child's toy rather than as a decorative object. During the second half of the 19th century, children were often socialized and educated in dominant Victorian gender and social ideologies through play. The presence of these toys in a privy associated with the first dormitory on campus strongly suggests that children of staff resided, played, and learned about their social worlds in the central areas of college life. As mentioned earlier, in the early days of the university, college faculty and staff lived on campus with their families. The main area of campus for this type of housing was located on the northern edge of campus and was called Faculty Row. Homes were built and occupied beginning in 1857 and through the 1910s. After the majority of faculty moved out of the homes in the early 1900s, many of the houses were repurposed for teaching. In total, 10 homes and one apartment building were constructed. The first four buildings were constructed in 1857 and only one building is still standing on campus today, which is the university president's house known as Cowell's house. As both faculty members and their families resided in these homes, Faculty Row became, as historian Madison Kuhn describes it, a place of children. Most families who lived on Faculty Row had at least one child and faculty recognized that it was an ideal place in which to rear a family. Notable faculty who had children while residing in Faculty Row include the Abbott, Kedzie, Cook, Carpenter, Beale, and Fairchild families. From archival evidence, we are able to glimpse the day-to-day -day lifestyle of faculty and their families. Dorothy Petit Reed, daughter, daughter of Rufus H. Petit, Remember that, quote, as a little girl, I loved everything about campus. The faculty were like aunts and uncles, and all the other campus brats, as they called us, were like sisters and brothers. 
Now I realize it was special. The whole campus was our playground, end quote. Dar David Fairchild, another child who grew up on faculty row, wrote, quote, that the setting of our childhood was quite ideal. The campus of the college was really only a clearing in the great Michigan forest, and it contained all of the elements necessary to develop happy, healthy boys and girls. There was a brook teeming with water life, sugar maples to tap when the sap ran fresh in the spring, and great black walnut trees, end quote. Madison Kuhn also notes that faculty and staff often joined the children in play and invited them into laboratories and other campus spaces. In latter decades, many of the first female students to join the university came from Faculty Row, themselves the grown-up daughters of faculty and staff. While the campus archaeology program has not conducted targeted excavations on Faculty Row, that region of campus has been extensively surveyed during campus construction projects. From these surveys, it has been confirmed that this region of campus is unfortunately highly disturbed due to the construction of college dormitories after the demolition of the faculty homes. Very few artifacts have been recovered in that region of campus, including window glass, brown bottle glass, wire and square cut nails, and undecorated ceramic whitewares, with the majority of material recovered being construction debris. At this time, no artifacts recovered from Faculty Row showcase the day-to-day -day lives of faculty and their families residing on campus during the first few decades of the university. The campus expanded exponentially as World War II ended. The university anticipated an unprecedented growth in its student body due to the GI Bill of Rights that guaranteed veterans the right to a college education with the bill covering fees, books, and $65 per month subsidence for single persons and $90 for married ones. MSU's enrollment doubled between 1946 and 1949, going from 8,000 veterans in 1946 to 16,000 in 1949. In 1949, MSU's rapidly rising enrollment numbers catapulted the university from 22nd place to ninth place in terms of nationwide university enrollment numbers. The university capitalized on the opportunity to educate veterans by being one of few universities to construct additional housing for them, including housing for married veterans. The university president at the time, President John A. Hanna, foresaw the need and helped encourage the university's board to secure $6 million to support housing construction. More students meant more classes needed to be taught and more people needed to teach them. In 1946, approximately 250 faculty were hired to address the educational demands of the growing campus. The growth of the student body resulted in classes taught six days a week instead of five, and class times were extended to run from seven in the morning to 10 at night on, on weekdays. It increased utility expenses across campus, required that classes initiate enrollment caps and resulted in the construction of new buildings, such as a classroom building, a science building, physics building, and power plant and facilities. Despite initially welcoming women on campus in its early days, women students who could not locate off-campus housing were refused admission to MSU due to the lack of adequate housing on campus for women. The town of East Lansing was not equipped to handle the influx of students or faculty needing housing. So the university, still known as Michigan State College, MSC, built temporary housing for them. There were three types of housing for faculty, 184 brick apartments, some of which were also assigned to married students, 31 steel Quonset huts, and 19 British Empire flat top houses. The steel Quonset huts were sourced from a variety of emergency war housing projects in various Michigan towns. The brick apartments known as the bricks and named for alumni who died in the war were pricey as they were not covered by the GI Bill like the Quonset huts. Student needs were more extensive, resulting in the construction of 104 Quonset huts for 1,456 single men featuring quote, and this is a quote from a historian, a bathhouse with 40 showers and a cafeteria and kitchen to feed 2,000 people, 
steel barracks to house 240 single men and 1,100 family units erected by the Federal Public Housing Authority, end quote. Space is not designed to house students for repurposed with 600 single men living in double deck bunk beds on a floor of an athletics building, which is Jenison Field House still on campus today, and 200 single men occupying a floor of the student union. The dramatic increase in married students and faculty resulted in an unprecedented number of children residing on campus. In 1947, there were over 1,560 student families living in temporary campus housing, which included 285 children under the age of five and 15 children six years or older. Off-campus families had even more young children, which numbered 500 children under the age of five in 1947. The rise in children on campus corresponded to national trends. Birth rates in America skyrocketed between 1946 and 1964, which is partially attributed to women delaying childbirth due to the depression and the war. In response to the immediate need for childcare and preschools to care for students, young children on campus, the Michigan State College Nursery was constructed. The nursery cared for children ages two to five. Its secondary purpose was to serve as a child development laboratory where professors and students could study, quote, the physical, mental, emotional, and social growth of children, end quote, and this is a dis uh, description from the archives, which fulfilled the college mission as a land-grant research institution. And in order to staff that nursery, families had to agree to volunteer their time to help with it. So, the families working in that nursery as well. In the summer of 2020, amid the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic, the lives of these post-World War II campus families were unearthed during a construction project on what is currently known as Service Road. So this is underneath what is Service Road right now. Construction work involved installing and extending utility lines. A large, nearly football field sized midden, or what we also call as a trash deposit or landfill, was encountered during the project that is in association with the post World War II housing on campus. Since only three campus archaeology program staff members were given permission to work on the project due to the pandemic, and normally we have about seven or eight people who uh, work on campus during um, the summers to help monitor construction. Controlled excavation of the site wasn't undertaken. Instead, it became a salvage project centered on recovering complete, datable, and identifiable artifacts that could tell the story of the faculty and students who lived on campus after World War II. Thousands of artifacts from this time period were recovered, including artifacts representing changing ideas about childbearing in America. The laboratory research is ongoing, artifacts identified thus far date predominantly from the 1940s to the 1960s. As national birth rates surged and the post-World War II economy stabilized, a consumer sphere directed at entertaining children took root. We see evidence of this in the archaeological data recovered from Service Road. A celluloid squeaker doll, which appears to be a white boy in bright blue overalls, was recovered from the project. It was likely manufactured between 1940 to 1947 by the Irwin Corporation of New Hampshire. The company was in operation from 1922 to 1973. The doll features a small squeaker at the base of the back of its head, which as a parent, I could imagine this would drive me nuts, <laughs> as toys with squeakers were popular in the 1940s. Celluloid toys like this doll stopped being produced in 1947 due to their flammable nature. A plastic toy automobile featuring what looks to be a convertible top was found thanks to a construction worker on the project, eyeing it as it was about to be crushed by a backhoe. Plastic toy automobiles were first produced in 1938. The manufacturer of this particular toy car appears to be the Renoir Wall Manufacturing Company, which made and sold plastic toy cars from the late 1940s to the mid 1950s. The style of the plastic car appears to date to this time period. 
National anxieties over improving STEM education also found expression in toys during this time period, which can be seen in the plastic uh, toy microscope recovered from Service Road. Due to concerns of our America falling behind in global scientific and technological advances, post-World War II school curricula sought to expand mathematics and scientific knowledge. Not all of children's play on campus required toys, however. Photographs and archival data from the community provide insight into children's creative play. A photograph dating to 1956 shows young children, including what looks to be a toddler, outside of the married student housing, playing in a large muddy pool of water. A letter written by Ray D. Lampier, a university employee and manager of married and veterans housing, notes that children living in, quote, the MSC trailers are not cognizant of the danger of playing in or near the roadway, end quote. Lamp here notes that people driving over the speed limit are endangering the lives of over 90 children, nearly all under the age of four, in the trailer housing. To solve the issue, issue he writes, quote, that enclosed play yards with sandbox have been constructed in each section throughout the entire area. End quote. Additionally, he remarks that the play yards have been placed in locations with no shade, though the road in which the children were previously playing also is in direct sunlight. Post-war parenting introduced new attitudes about child rearing, including exploratory play, such as the play described above, and an emphasis on following the child's lead when it comes to nurturing and caring for them. Dr. Spock, a pediatrician, spearheaded a more gentle nurturing approach to parenting during this time period. Perhaps reflecting this change from raising children with a firm hand to rearing children with their developmental and psychological needs in mind, decorative ceramics specifically manufactured for children's use and entertainment were found during the construction project. A plate manufactured by Arabia, a Finnish ceramic company still in operation today, for children was recovered. The pattern, which is known as Zoo or Parade, features a wide variety of animals, including an elephant, and was in production from 1951 to 1968. A small child-sized ceramic creamware creamer featuring bunny rabbits was also found. This creamer was part of the Roseville Pottery Company's juvenile line of ceramics for children, hence the line's name. Other juvenile ceramics which were manufactured from 1910 to the early 1920s, featured ducks, pigs, cats, dogs, and cows. Though not specifically manufactured for children, one half of a set of interlocking hugging, hugging ceramic bear salt and pepper shakers was recovered. And here's a photograph of it that's just absolutely adorable with its patent. One could easily envision parents using these whimsical bears to encourage their children to sit down and eat a meal at the kitchen table. The patent for this set was obtained by his artist, Ruth Van Telligen in 1951. Based on its maker's mark, a mark on the base of a ceramic that archeologists use to date artifacts that we see here in the photograph, which these often changed over time, it appears as though this set dates to between 1951 and 1958. Finally, a Pyrex Evenflow borosilicate glass bottle dating to as early as 1927 was found at the site and reflects cultural changes in how infants were to be fed. The bottle featured a six-sided design to prevent the bottle from rolling. While some doctors encouraged breastfeeding, new parenting manuals and guides suggested parents institute scheduled, regimented infant feeding patterns. Following this advice, advice, parents in mass turned to bottle feeding. Consequently, no generation in American history was less likely to be breastfed. A plastic Pyrex nursing bottle nipple, its patent dating to September 14, 1937, was also recovered from the site, reflecting the shift in infant feeding patterns. Other material reminders of the vibrant role children played on MSU's campus in the post-World War II years found last summer include this child's small mitten, probably lost, I'm guessing during winter, sadly, a glass blue marble, a plastic red child-sized shovel, 
small children's leather shoes. And this ceramic doll with a pink dress likely tossed because of its headless state. <laughs> The artifacts recovered on what is today MSU's campus reflects circumstances internal to campus as well as external shifts in the perception of children and child rearing in American culture. On campus, children's roles have been historically dependent on student enrollment. In its early days as a small agricultural college when horses were the primary form of transportation across campus, Children, students, and faculty intermingled, sharing both living and workspaces in what is now known as a sacred space, the center of the historic campus, also known as West Circle. When the campus expanded exponentially in response to the need to educate veterans coming home from World War II, students and faculty were moved south of the sacred space in West Circle and therefore away from the main part of campus. New buildings to house laboratories and classrooms were erected, forcing student and faculty housing away from the sacred space. As the campus continues to grow in modern times, faculty and student families have been relegated to off-campus housing. Today, MSU views family housing as a responsibility of students and faculty rather than the universities. This is a notable shift from the earliest days of the college where students and children live side by side in Saints Rest Dormitory. While research on children continues to be conducted and childcare is offered on the outskirts of campus, children are no longer frolicking across campus or attending college classes alongside professors and adult students as they once did not so long ago. Today's children play a more transitory role in campus life, visiting campus for short-term summer programming rather than living on campus year round. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, children arrived in droves on campus as soon as college students moved out at the end of spring semester, like this time of year right now. During the summers, children participated in gifted and talented program in horseback riding, basketball, baseball, football, ice hockey, swimming, music, art and mathematics camps, to name just a few of the numerous opportunities for youth on campus. In the summers prior to COVID-19, grandparents and their grandchildren also arrive for Grandparents University, where the two groups spend several days on campus bonding and taking university classes, including a course on archaeology directed by myself and other archaeologists in the MSU Campus Archaeology Program. Though children no longer leave a substantial material record on campus, there are still ephemeral reminders of their presence. This was made apparent with the discovery of a small plastic dinosaur toy during the 2020 service road construction project. This artifact is a McDonald's Happy Meal toy associated with the 1994 release of the film The Flintstones. What the preceding discussion illustrates is that children's roles on campus have never been static, nor are they archaeologically invisible, even when they play a much smaller role in contemporary campus life. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. So for, the, for those of you listening on the Zoom webinar, you can type your questions into the Q&A section. And if you're listening on Facebook Live, you can type them into the comments section and we'll give you a few minutes to do that. So in normal times, Stacy, is there a place where people could come view these artifacts? Yes. There's, there's a lot of opportunities to view these artifacts. So sometimes we have exhibits at archives at MSU Library. Uh, we're hoping to do an exhibit eventually at MSU Museum. And then we're always active participants in Science Fest every year when we have the expo. And that's when we get the most visitors is there's usually thousands of kids coming through and we have lots of hands-on opportunities to touch artifacts and see artifacts and look at them. Um, but yeah, in normal times, yes, uh, definitely, definitely. Awesome. Do you have a favorite artifact that you've uncovered <laughs> since you've been on campus? Oh my goodness, that's hard. I think the most interesting call that I got, because we do construction and monitoring all throughout the year, whenever construction's happening, was I got a call early in the morning over the summer saying they had found bones and someone was concerned it was a dinosaur um, or a mammoth. 
And, you know, we never want to find remains on campus. We don't want to find especially human remains. So we go out immediately if we hear bones. And um, so we went out to what is today Conrad Hall. They were redoing the road out there and they were about 15 feet down, really, really deep, um, which appeared to now be the historic surface. So they had filled up that area of campus like they had done across most of our campus because it was marshy in its early days to make a level landscape. And as they were doing that um, to build the road or other things, they covered up this cow skeleton, an entire cow skeleton. And luckily I had a, a person on staff, Autumn Painter, one of the authors of this talk, who's a zooarchaeologist and she studies animal bones. And she was able to look at the bones and figure out that it was a bull and that it had really worn um, bone spurs. So the bones were really worn down, its teeth were really ground down. And that told us it was old. We looked at it, it wasn't butchered. So it had been buried complete. You know, normally if you eat a, a animal, you butcher it up and then the bones are kind of everywhere, but this was like a burial. So we dove into the archives, which were right in front of where the cow was found. <laughs> and we found that that was where MSU's bull barn was. And that's what we think it was. It was one of the prize bull. If you look into archives, MSU archives has a lot of their photos online. You can see photographs of former university administrators, deans, um, presidents pictured with the bulls, prize bulls. So we think it was a special bull that was buried there and taken really good care of because it was so old. So we have an entire cow skeleton in the lab that we usually bring to events so that kids can touch the bones and like learn more about um, identifying uh, animal remains. Well, that's awesome. I'd love to see that myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Once COVID is over. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So for um, young adults or students that are still up at this late night, um, how did you get interested in archaeology and doing what you do? Uh, you know, I always liked geology as a kid. I liked rocks and my dad would take me out to the desert and we'd look at fossil beds and rocks and he would take me to rock conventions, which seems really odd, but I was kind of a nerd about rocks and um in high school, I volunteered at a museum, a children's museum, and like a not children's museum, an adult museum, and I just got interested in collections, and what always interested me about archaeology wasn't so much the stuff, I mean, it is interesting, but the connections that people forge with the material objects. So one of the first archaeological digs I went on was in Ireland, and the professor that was running it was doing it to study the descendants of the people in this town who were victims of, of the potato famine. And so he was trying to address questions that this community had about these families. And that's what interested me was how we can use archeology span to address questions that people have about their families or their past in the contemporary world. So it's always been the stories that are important to people and, and what, that's why I've been um, drawn to archaeology. Awesome. And I imagine your career will always be there because we always need to look at our past and um, delve into what was there before us. Yes, there's a lot of federal legislation, thankfully, in our country that outlines um, how sites, at least on federal land, are treated. And, you know, archaeologists are trying to do better, too. We haven't been a perfect <laughs> discipline at all. And so we're trying to repair and reconcile relationships that we have with some communities that we haven't consulted about their past. So I think, you know, things have changed in our field, and I'm, I'm really positive that things will continue to change in the coming years. Awesome. Well, I don't see that we have any questions coming in anymore. So with that, I think we'll wrap it up for the night. But uh, we still do have more of the Science Festival going on through April 30th. And you can find out um, all the talks that we still have left at sciencefestival.msu.edu. And thank you, Dr. Camp, for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. I hope everyone has a wonderful and safe rest of their week. Um, good night. Night.